Welcome to Uplook's 2018 Summer Bible Program. We're studying 16 key salvation terms. Today's lesson, God's Preparations for Salvation in Eternity, Election. I'd like to begin by reading a few important verses from Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. As we continue to read, we're going to read about some of these particular blessings, but please notice they were not designed to be a battlefield. More people have argued and fought over these words than God ever intended. And so it's important for us when we look at subjects dealing with God's salvation and various aspects of it, that our hearts be worshipful and submissive and humble as we look at these important ideas. In verse 4 he says, Just as he chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now you notice right away that the Apostle Paul is linking choosing with this list of blessings. And he's telling us that we have been chosen by God in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. God did the choosing. The sphere of our choosing is in Christ. The time of our choosing was before the foundation of the world and the purpose of our choosing is that we should be holy and without blame before him. Now the phrase before him is used over 150 times in the Pentateuch or before the Lord to describe the worship and service of the Lord. The animals, we might say they were slain at the door of the tabernacle, or we could say they were slain before the altar. But the scripture says they were slain before the Lord. The showbread was there before the Lord. The menorah was before the Lord. And the whole purpose of God designing this intricate tabernacle and later the temple, and his whole purpose in giving us Christ and opening heaven to us and taking down the middle wall of partition, removing the veil and bringing us by the blood of Christ into the holiest is that we might serve and worship before him. He wants nearness. He wants us close to him. And for this purpose, God set about this great plan of redemption that we who were far off might be made near by the blood of Christ. So we are chosen in him. Christ is the chosen one. And just as in the nation of Israel, a young man was not chosen and therefore put into Israel. He was chosen because he was in Israel. God chose Israel not to save them all. With many of them, God was not well pleased. Some of them dropped whole into the pit because of their rebellion. But he chose the nation corporately to be the vehicle through which he would send the world the three greatest gifts the gift of the scriptures, the gift of his son, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when we read about the being chosen in him, it's not suggesting that we are chosen and therefore put into him, but we are chosen in him. It is because we are in him that we are chosen, in the same way that an Israelitish male was chosen because he was in Israel. And the purpose of this choosing is for the grand scheme of reconciling people to God, of bringing them into his family, of bringing them into his service, into his ministry, into his heart. It is this drawing people to himself that is involved in the subject. When we look at this word election or choosing, it's simply the anglicized form of the Greek word eklektos, when we look at the subject in the scripture, God is not in any way confusing on the matter. It's that people have jumped to conclusions instead of reading 
the rest of the sentence. So we read concerning this matter of election that um, not only was Israel chosen, Aaron was chosen, he and his sons, to serve the Lord in Deuteronomy 18, verse 5. God has chosen him to stand to serve him and his sons. Now, Jerusalem was chosen. In this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen, I will put my name forever, 2 Kings 21, 7. Judas Iscariot was chosen. The Lord Jesus said, Did not I choose you twelve, and one of you is a devil? And then, of course, Christ was chosen. Behold my servant, whom I hold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, Isaiah 42.1. So Christ is chosen. Is he chosen to be saved? Obviously not. He's the Savior. He doesn't need to be saved. The elect angels, were they chosen to be saved? No, they never rebelled. They didn't need to be saved. Was all Israel saved? No. They were chosen. They were all chosen, but they weren't all saved. And some who were not chosen, not part of the elect, like Rahab the harlot or Ruth the Moabitess, they came into the blessing of Israel and they were chosen because now they were in Israel. But when we find Judas Iscariot listed with the twelve as those whom Christ has chosen, obviously it doesn't mean that they were chosen to be saved. God chooses for a role various vessels, whether the nation of Israel or the Lord Jesus or the city of Jerusalem or the uh, Aaronic priesthood, Judas Iscariot, the eleven, or you and me. The choosing of individuals or groups of individuals seems to be choosing for a role in the purposes of God. There may be one exception, and we'll look at that, in every other case in Scripture where God speaks about choosing or election, it doesn't have to do with salvation. And if we are to turn to the scripture and read exactly what it says, I, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And then he goes on to explain the reason, that you might go forth and bear fruit. And so the idea of God selecting certain people to be saved and others to be lost is contradicted by scores of verses throughout the scripture where God says he is not a respecter of persons. He does not take delight in the death of the wicked. Uh, he, he longs for all men to be saved. Uh, endless verses that speak about the heart of God towards the whole human race. When we think about election then, let's be careful that we read it in the context, that we understand what is being said, that God has chosen, he has selected to use those who are weak and broken, and even those who seem to be um, choice vessels like Paul, he found ways to neutralize their own personal strengths and to cast them on God that they might depend on him and that all the glory might eventually go to the Lord. So as we read through these scriptures and we look at these verses, I encourage you to get out your concordance and your Bible and read through all the passages that speak about God's choosing, his election, and I think you will find consistently throughout it, it cannot mean that God determined to save all of Israel or that he determined to save Christ or determined to save Jerusalem or Judas Iscariot. No, he chose them for a role in his purposes and he found a way, even Christ coming into this world came in weakness. He came in weakness. The preaching of the gospel seems foolishness. God found a way to neutralize anything of man's glory, anything of man's power and strength. And the whole objective was that we might be vessels that reveal the glory of God. We have this treasure in clay pots, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the glory may be of God and not of us.
Welcome again to these continuing studies on the building blocks of salvation. And uh, we're talking about the subject of election or choosing and some of the key questions that people ask on this subject. And David's been doing some research and uh, he has, I think, some good questions for us. So David, why don't you go ahead with uh, your first one? Uh, yes, the first one uh, looks at two verses that seem to say that there are people that are elect to salvation. What comments do you have on these? The first verse being 2 Timothy 2 verse 10. All right, let me read uh, the three verses from verse 8 through 10. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now once again, when we look at a passage like this, we have to ask, what election is he referring to? There are elect angels, and Israel is elect, and the church is elect, and so on. And so we need to be careful that we understand who's being referred to here. Uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of the Jews in uh, Romans 9 uh, through 11, and he says there in chapter 10 and verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And also in chapter 11, verse 28, Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the fathers or the patriarch's sake. And so the idea here is that um, Paul longs to see those who have been elected, that is chosen for the purpose of spreading God's blessing to the whole world, but who have been set aside by their unbelief, he still longs to see these people saved. And so I think it's important for us to understand uh, this idea that God's election uh, having to do with Israel, although they have been set aside temporarily as a nation, he has not given up on his plan eventually to reach the nation of Israel and so says Paul, all Israel shall be saved. What a great reminder of how God has elected different groups of people for different purposes, uh, mm -hmm. looking at that verse. Uh, the second verse uh, that seems to say that people are elect to salvation is 2 Thessalonians 2.13. So what comments do you have uh, from this verse? Okay, well let me read the verse, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And in our earlier studies, we talked about the importance of understanding that salvation can be in the past, the present, or the future. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved from the influence or power of sin. And I will be saved someday from the very presence of sin. And so it's important for us to understand the theme of 2 Thessalonians. These believers who were somewhat untaught in the matters of the future events, they thought that they had missed out somehow on the rapture and that they were going through the tribulation. And Paul explains this at the beginning of chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, uh, don't be soon shaken, he says, in mind, or troubled uh, by spirit or by word or by letter as if uh, from us as though the day of Christ had come. And so he explains that uh, this great man of sin is going to come and those who uh, do not have a love for the truth are going to come under the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Uh, however, uh, we're thankful, he says, that God from the beginning chose you to be saved. That is, 
to be taken out of the world before the wrath of God falls. And so in the context, uh, I believe that's the clear meaning of the passage. And, and there's a resource at Uplook.org concerning this verse, is that right? Exactly, yes. I, I wrote a, a little blog article on this very verse because it does concern people. One passage of scripture that is often considered with the topic of election is Romans chapter 9. Now, if this passage is not referring to God choosing some for salvation, why would Paul then anticipate that some would think God is unrighteous in verse 14? Now, anyone who's done a serious reading of the book of Romans knows what the theme of Romans is. It's the righteousness of God and how we can acquire that righteousness. And of course, there are various options suggested, one of them working uh, to do it, one uh, to gain credibility through my link with Israel, uh, one by keeping the law, and so on. And Paul shows that each of these is invalid for very clear reasons and that the only way we can receive the righteousness of God is through faith in Christ. And so it's a gift of grace. Um, so when we come to the end of chapter 8, we have this crescendo of praise where he declares there's nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, which sounds terrific. But imagine the Roman believer sitting there and beginning to think now, wait a minute, uh, what about the Jews? Weren't they loved by God? Uh, weren't they secure? Didn't he say through Jeremiah, I've loved you with an everlasting love? What's happened? And if they could lose their position of favor and love, maybe we could too. And that's why Paul segues into this discussion. And you'll notice it's no dry theological issue with him. Uh, he, he is passionate about this and actually says he could wish himself accursed from Christ in order to see the Jewish people saved. Now, as we follow down through the argument, he, he begins in verse 4 to explain all of the singular blessings that came to the nation of Israel. And um, he speaks about uh, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, and so on. And it concludes with whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. So right away we see that their choice the selection of the nation of Israel was not to salvation for Israel, it was to provide a savior for the whole world. And uh, he goes on to say that not all Israel are of Israel. There are those who were physically related to Abraham who are not part of that chosen number. And so obviously when he refers to those who are the chosen ones, he's explaining to us why God chose this very narrow path uh, through the nation of Israel, why he chose Isaac and not Ishmael, why he chose Jacob and not Esau. And we don't have to guess at the basis of his choice because he says why, and he says that the elder shall serve the younger. So he says it wasn't because of the children in their performance seemed to be a better choice, because the choice was made before they were born, before they'd done any good or evil. That's in verse 11. And the election then would stand not on works, but on the basis of him who calls. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. Now here it's not talking about individual people. Uh, the Lord had said there are two nations in your womb. And uh, the term Jew, of course, the description of the Jews, as opposed to all the other nations, the Gentiles, God specifically selected them and isolated them through various rituals and clothing and food laws. 
so that they couldn't mingle among the Gentiles with the objective of protecting the messianic line until the Savior could come. So this idea, the elder shall serve the younger, is going to be one of the motifs throughout the scripture. The idea being that in the spiritual sense, uh, it's through the second birth that I receive the blessings of God, not through the first birth. And the idea that the elder, that is what I am by my natural birth, should be a servant to what I am through my spiritual birth and not the other way around. So he, he then makes this statement, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. So the idea is that, that God was not playing favorites by selecting one over the other, but he was establishing the principle that the first one born who had a right by law would be bypassed to those who did not have a right by law who could simply claim God's grace and mercy. Now it didn't mean then that the one born first could not get in on the blessing of God, but they would have to come through the door of mercy and not by demanding their rights. And uh, this was the great debate that the Lord Jesus was constantly having with the Jewish leaders who thought they had a place by right because they were Abraham's children. And the Lord Jesus made it clear to them that that was not the case. So uh, the objection that people might have is that it appears as if God has been unrighteous in selecting certain people over other people. But the purpose of that selection was to isolate a line of humanity through which the Savior of the world would come and then the salvation would be offered to everyone. And so when the statement is made, immediately following this, he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy uh, and I'll have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Um, he immediately introduces then the subject of Pharaoh. The issue now is, what happens if those agents whom God has chosen to accomplish his purposes resist his work in their lives? He's going to ultimately get to Israel and this issue that they blinded themselves, they rejected their Messiah, and the question is, if people fail, does God fail? And the answer, of course, is no. The actual fact is that Pharaoh ends up accomplishing God's purpose. And the idea that Pharaoh was hardened, God hardened Pharaoh in his own choice. So God has specifically explained to us in his word that his choice was for the ultimate objective of blessing the whole world. He chose Abraham, that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So at the end of this section he says, God has concluded all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. That's always been God's objective. And this is the glorious gospel. So you Romans and you believers today, don't be afraid that you're going to slip out of his hands, that he's going to turn away his love from you. The reason he set Israel aside was not because he stopped loving them. The reason he set them aside was that through that a blessing that had been given to Israel, it would then come to the Gentiles who would accomplish his purpose. And part of that purpose was to bring the blessing back to Israel. So if we can follow the line of reasoning, we worship with Paul and we say, who has been God's counselor? Where did he get these amazing ideas from? We worship him that he found a way to extend his mercy and grace to every creature. Yeah, it's great to see when talking about Pharaoh and how uh, he's not an object of wrath, but he's a vessel of wrath. Uh, so God is using him like a vessel uh, for his wrath. And like you said in chapter 11, the reason is to have mercy on all. And so when we look at the result of God's wrath in Egypt, we see uh that when Joshua gets to Jericho, Rahab says, we remember what mm. your God did to Pharaoh. Right. And then hundreds of years later, when the Ark of the Covenant gets taken by the Philistines and God sends plagues on the Philistines, they say, we mm -hmm. remember yeah. what happened to the Egyptians. So right. even all those years ago, 
and uh, even uh, the culmination of the plagues uh, was the uh, was the Passover, mm -hmm. one, probably the greatest gospel message in the Old Testament. And so, uh, using Pharaoh as a vessel of wrath, God is able to extend His mercy uh, through that. Amen. Amen. Remember to like the video, leave comments, and we'll take those questions that people leave and make a Q&A exclusively on those questions. Make sure to share and subscribe uh, to keep in touch with all new and upcoming videos.